there is a lot of respect across industry for what Māori are doing. There has been a significant change and that Māori is now seen as, as leaders and as innovators in the area and as having something to contribute. You know, the language, Māori language and thinking is coming to structure, thinking and strategy within industry leadership. Hello, welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, Season 2, Global Ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the big questions in the field of global environmental politics. I'm Peter Andre from Carleton University. My co-host for the show is Dr. Ryan katz from the University of Ottawa, though Ryan is not joining us for this episode. Today, we're going to look at the relationship between global agri-food systems and climate change putting that into the context of the shifting power relations of settler colonialism and reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. The 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change <clears throat> sets ambitious targets intended to keep global temperature increases below 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. In response, industrialized countries are putting in place frameworks to try to achieve net zero carbon emissions across their economies by 2050. To reach net zero carbon, a lot needs to change in just 29 years, including how land is managed and how food is produced. Today, we'll focus on livestock farming, which is responsible for about 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions in terms of direct emissions from domesticated animals, and 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions if you include the entire livestock supply chain. At the same time as states are trying to wrap their heads around how to address climate change, Settler colonialism in countries like Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, all former colonies of the British Empire, is facing a reckoning. Settler colonialism involved the takeover, usually violent, of the traditional lands and resources of Indigenous peoples. Even when formal treaties were signed between the British and Indigenous peoples, ostensibly allowing settlement on agreed-upon terms, adherence to those treaties by settlers and their governments was rare. At their worst, colonial land relations were genocidal. At the very least, they marginalized indigenous people within the colonies, preventing them from continued management of their resources. After many decades of resistance and advocacy by indigenous people, these histories of dispossession and marginalization, which persist into the present day through intergenerational trauma and ongoing social inequities, have really come into the spotlight. In Canada, for example, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC documented the history of the residential school system in this country and released calls to action intended to further reconciliation. Similar efforts are taking place across settler states to come to terms with the history of settler colonialism, to identify appropriate forms of reconciliation and to negotiate redress. So climate change, agri-food systems, settler colonialism and reconciliation are all connected. And today we're going to dig into those connections by focusing on the case of the dairy industry in Aotearoa, the indigenous Maori name for New Zealand. We'll be talking with two people I met in Aotearoa while I was there on sabbatical in early 2020. Dr. John Reed is Senior Research Fellow with the Naitahu Research Centre at the University of Canterbury. He is of Maori heritage and works closely with a variety of tribes known as iwi across Aotearoa. He specializes in indigenous economic development with a focus on land, freshwater, and ocean sustainability. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, John. Kia ora. Kia ora, Peter. Nice to be here. I'm really glad that you're here with us here today. And I also just want to introduce Professor Hugh Campbell. He's a New Zealander of European background. He's a sociologist of agri-food systems based out of the University of Otago in Dunedin. He recently published a book called Farming Inside Invisible Worlds. Modernist Agriculture and Its Consequences, which deals in part with how his own family's history of farming in New Zealand involved a hidden history. This is a story of attempted erasure of Maori land uses and understandings of how to relate to the land. His book is part of a growing effort in Aotearoa to render visible this hidden history as one step in the long-term process of decolonization. Kia ora to you, Hugh. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast. Kia ora, Peter. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. It's uh, lovely to be able to join you in this conversation. So my takeaway from my time in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is that uh, your country may be at the forefront of confronting some of these issues at the intersection of agri-food systems, climate change, 
settler colonialism and reconciliation. Um, but that's just my take, and I'd love to. I'm looking forward to hearing how the two of you look at it. I'll direct my first question towards you, John. I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about yourself and your background and how that relates to what we're talking about, which is this question of uh, the intersection of agri food systems, climate change, and uh, settler colonialism. Oh, sure. Thanks, uh, Peter. Um, so um, my background is I descend from a tribe called uh, Ngāti Pikiao, which is in the central North Island of New Zealand. And uh, so I became uh, very interested in, uh, in land issues um, around, uh, particularly Māori land issues, um, given our own family's history with uh, Māori land um, and reservation land in the sort of central North Island of New Zealand. Growing up, I had a concern um, for the environment and particularly the way in which uh, the land was being treated. And so those two things converged. And uh, when I went to university, I um, looked at um, land sustainability, particularly focused in on uh, community forestry and uh, agriculture. And um, later, I started to examine more closely um, those issues related to Māori land and uh, Māori land development. And that was happening at a time when uh, the treaty settlement processes um, were underway in New Zealand, which we'll come to talk about. But at that time, uh, Māori were um, receiving compensation assets from the New Zealand government, um, including large tracts of land. And so as part of that process, there was a question of how do Māori uh, manage and operate on these lands that are returning to them, often, often with legacy land management systems. And so a lot of my work has examined um, those issues, particularly different land management processes around sustainability, and particularly the indigenous um, Māori perspective on sustainability and how that makes its way into how we think about land management in New Zealand. And then more broadly, how does that then further impact New Zealand's land management policies and regulations? Thank you, John. I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into uh, some of those questions. Um, but you, you mentioned already the treaty settlement process. And uh, for listeners outside of uh, New Zealand who may not know what that means, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the Treaty of Waitangi of 1840 and um, what that was and what the, uh, the Waitangi Tribunal is that's leading to this treaty settlement process of today? Yeah, sure. So, well, first of all, there's two versions of the Treaty of Waitangi. Now, it was signed between the Crown and the different tribes around New Zealand, um, which we refer to as, as you referred to before, as Iwi. Um, and it was signed back in 1840. But there were two versions of the treaty. And so one's referred to as the Treaty of Waitangi, and the other one's called referred to as Te Tiriti or Waitangi, which is the uh, Māori name. But they were two quite distinct and separate versions. So I think today I'll refer to the um, Te Tiriti of Waitangi, the Māori version, because that is the version that the vast majority of iwi or tribes signed. So that treaty was made up of three articles. And the first article provided a platform for the Crown to assume kawanatanga or governance over New Zealand. Now for Māori, this wasn't seen as handing over sovereignty. Um, given that un under Article 2 of the treaty, um, Māori were guaranteed what Māori referred to as rangatiratanga, which is chieftainship. And that gave them full, in their mind, full control over their territories and resources within them. But they felt under Article 1, kawanatanga, that the Crown would assume a governing role. There was also an Article 3, and that Article 3 guaranteed Māori the right of citizenship. So a lot of Māori were interested in gaining access to the trade network of the British Empire, and they saw this also as a, as a pathway into becoming part of this uh, broader system. But Article 2 of the treaty also gave the Crown what is known as the right of preemption. So that meant that only the Crown could buy land from Māori. Now, what happened once, Crown, uh, once the Crown bought that land it came under a different jurisdiction. So while that land remained an Indigenous title under the chiefs, it came under Māori law, L-O-R-E, but once it transferred to the Crown, it came under Crown law and, um, and it came under Crown jurisdiction. So what they often refer to is that New Zealand was colonised by contract. And what that means is that the Crown vigorously moved to purchase as much land as possible to ensure that that land transferred from the chieftainship of the chiefs to the Crown jurisdiction. And, uh, and of course, that process involved a lot of 
um, underhanded dealings and uh, a whole range of other issues which have come up today um, to be resolved through the Treaty of Waitangi settlement process. There are also large tracts of land that were confiscated um, through Raupatu, which is the, the taking of land. And so um, the treaty settlement processes were developed um, and uh, well, they certainly started to get underway in earnest in the, um, in the 1990s um, to deal with issues around the way in which these resources were taken, the way in which the, the colonization process occurred and to seek redress um, on behalf of those uh, iwi or natural groupings. And and just to come full circle, then uh, you were you began by talking about how you work in sustainable uh, economic development uh, with Iwi, and as I understand of that, a lot of your work is really focused on Iwi that uh, now are regaining control of lands, possibly their traditional lands. In some cases, it's lands in other parts of the country that they are then might be under land management already, might be in farms and that they are, that are now become economic assets for the uh, for the community is that correct yeah that's right so the treaty settlement process has usually had uh, several sort of components to them so one was often the return of assets so that could involve usually crown land land that was currently in crown ownership and that would return to the tri- to a um, to an iwi or a tribe the second thing was um, often cash and the third thing was certain rights around governing rights, particularly at local government scales and uh, um, around the way in which resources in the traditional tribal areas were managed. So you've seen the formation of a lot of co-governance relationships um, with our, what we have here at our local government level, which are local councils, a lot of co-governance between the tribes that have settled and with their local councils. So there's a sort of a political dimension and there's the economic dimension in terms of the return of land. And so the main tribe I've worked with over the years is Ngaitahu, which is um, New Zealand's largest iwi by um, land area and second largest by population. And it, its tribal area is most of the um, land area of the South Island of New Zealand, probably three quarters of that area. And that settlement included um, uh, farmland and forestry um, land. Um, but also the tribe has also embarked upon quite um, substantial dairy farm developments. Great. And thanks thanks for uh, clarifying those points. And I, I want to come back uh, shortly, but I'd like to bring Hugh in now. Uh, Hugh, as I understand it, your family's background is in farming. And I'd, I'd like you to tell us a little more about that background and how this relates to the book you just wrote and really how that book relates to this discussion of reconciliation and, and treaty settlement in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, yes, John's really beautifully elaborated the centrality of the treaty and land in the colonising of New Zealand. And uh, I mean, what he's laid out is how at that at that early colonial moment, the treaty was somewhere between indistinct and, and outright fraudulent. And so there was a period of some decades uh, in which you know many different pathways could have happened in New Zealand. Uh, we might have ended up being all sorts of different kind of colony. But what eventually locked New Zealand into one particular trajectory for really what was going to be over 100 years uh, was the centrality of the farm, particularly the farms of you know, European, particularly British settlers, what we call Pākehā, uh, arriving and using their crown right of preemption and getting hold of land. Of course, also, there were some moments of uh, very dire military engagement and the like. But the thing that really uh, shifted and marginalised Māori from the land was the arrival of Pākehā farmers. And farm by farm, parcel by parcel, the New Zealand landscape, particularly from the 1860s onwards, got drawn slowly into this huge pastoral farming estate. And I grew up uh, on one of those Pākehā farms. And the the story that I knew of our farm um, through my childhood and the one that was uh, very 
the sort of the normal narrative of being a Pakeha farmer in New Zealand was, well, one, we weren't Pakeha farmers, we were just family farmers. And I was, the, the sort of the myths I grew up by was, was that, you know, the New Zealand family farm was a, was a pastoral farm, it was either a, a sheep, beef or dairy system, and it was the most efficient in the world, it was the most scientific in the world, and we were fantastic. We, we were just uh, an exemplar of, of how farming could be done, and uh, we, were also, we were also nice folks as well. When I became an, uh, you know, when I became an academic and began becoming interested in, you know, dynamics of rural sociology, and uh, I, I spent a lot of my career writing about the neoliberalisation of New Zealand farming, and then more recently about the colonisation of New Zealand uh, through farming. Uh, I began to reflect back on my own upbringing in a very different kind of way, and I, so I wrote I wrote the book Farming Inside Invisible Worlds, predominantly based around the story of six of my own family's farms stretching back from the 1850s through to the 1920s in terms of the initial histories and then uh, through to the present day, and how our histories, for me as a kid who grew up on a Pākehā farm, the histories of our farms are incredibly complicated, but that complexity is essentially avoided by rendering worlds around us invisible, including our histories invisible. And so that whole complicated story that John just laid out about treaty settlement and the way in which crown purchasing of land and the transfer of that land into Pākehā ownership to create farms just was absent, completely absent from my upbringing. And so as a result, uh, our farm existed in a nice sort of little bubble all on its own and we didn't have to think about too many of the wider consequences of what we did. So yeah, I wrote the book about what do you find out if you start looking into those invisible worlds around the farm that I grew up in and how does that change the terms of how we think about farming both in the past but also in the future in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, Hugh, I'd, I w- I'd like to ask you just to uh, link what you've just been talking about in terms of the history of your uh, family's experience and and uh, the colonization process in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, with this move that that I had a sense was uh, was active within New Zealand culture today, which is uh, what we can broadly call a sort of a, a trying to reckon with the past and uh, the process of decolonization, if you might call it that, which I know is a very contested term, but I wonder where you see the kind of work that you're doing fitting in with this idea of decolonization? Yes, it's an excellent question. And I think what I have tried to do in the narrative of the book is is, is by both locating the farm as an agent of colonization and recognizing the farm as, as having dynamic agency as a shaper of landscape and, you know, farms in the sense of farms as human and non-human assemblages that, that, these, these farms had tremendous agency to colonise New Zealand and to erase and to marginalise and to create boundaries. But in the latter stages of the narrative, I really tried to turn to ask the more hopeful side of that uh, analysis, which is if farms can colonise, can farms decolonise? And do farms become a site where different relations with landscape become possible, where different futures get enacted? And so uh, I think really the great colonisation of New Zealand hit a brick wall in 1973 when Britain entered the European common market and New Zealand lost its last vestiges of a colonial trading relationship with Britain and was sort of thrown into a period of huge crisis. And I've spent most of my academic career studying the different ways in which that crisis played out. But the one that became, well, it was partly surprising and also extremely hopeful was that out of this huge turmoil and crisis in farming in New Zealand, some really hopeful things began to appear. It's not the way we like to think about crisis, that you need something really big and terrible to happen to break down huge institutional powers and cultural norms. But that's kind of what happened in New Zealand farming. And so out of that period of crisis and what I lived through in terms of my adult life and what all my contemporary farm family who still are on farms uh, have experienced was this tremendous kind of diversification and heterogeneous uh, array of things that are happening uh, in the New Zealand landscape. 
But in terms of what John's talking about, that begins to happen very late in terms of its consciousness for Pākehā farmers. It's only very recently that the, the great uh, mainstream institutions of Pākehā farming began to realise that Māori were doing something I was going to say new and exciting, but actually Māori were reviving something old and incredibly useful and exciting in terms of how we relate to land. And so in the last 10 years, you've started to see a really powerful, slow and seemingly unstoppable emergence of new Māori land trusts and incorporations and mainstream uh, farming organisations like our Government Farmer Land Corp starting to look towards Māori principles and land use. And it's both incredibly unexpected from for people like me who were sitting in New Zealand farming 40 years ago, where any any involvement of Māori in, in, in the future of New Zealand farming was just unthinkable, to now really looking at it and going, this is the pathway forward. You know, the pathway forward is being enacted in front of us by uh, inspirational groups of uh, Maori owners and, and land governance arrangements and, uh, and particular close relationships with the land. Uh, very inspiring. It's a very, very inspiring time to be living in. Well, I really want to uh, turn to John now. And, and Hugh asked a provocative question earlier. Can farming decolonize? I, I... And I might broaden that to uh, Pākehā land relations in general. What's your perspective on this, John? Yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty, it's a very broad, uh, you know, and deep question. So um, I, I suppose I might just take a little step back um, and start to think a little bit about sort of the Māori, the traditional Māori perspective um, and relationship to land. So from a Māori perspective, the world is sort of structured by a concept called whakapapa, which means that you're basically related to everything around you in the natural world, whether it's a river or the, the land or, or forests or pasture, whatever it is, they're parts of the family tree. And another core um, concept is that of Modi. And Modi means that it's sort of the life supporting capacity of something. So for example, if you have a river and it's polluted, it would have low modi. But if it wasn't polluted and there was abundance within it, you'd say it has high modi. So from that Maori perspective, there's this idea that the things around, in terms of the ethics of relating to the world around you, that you have an obligation to increase the modi or may at least maintain the modi of the land and the resources that are around you because it's understood that if you don't under, under you look after the rest of the family, the family can't look after you. So it's this idea if you increase the modi of those things, it'll increase your modi. So it's kind of like a symbiotic um, way of thinking about the world. And so with that sort of way of thinking, which tends to frame um, the way most iwi understand the world and understand the way in which you relate to it, that has come to shape the technology of farming, in particular the choice of technologies. And the way in which these tribes are structured through settlement processes is that um, most of the structures were more or less imposed externally by the Crown on the way in which settlement processes could occur. So they were kind of um, forced into what the Crown called natural groupings, um, which were large groupings of people. And then the assets were then compensated or provided to those groups under large trust structures. And so the resources that were once owned at sort of family levels are all kind of pulled together and centralised and they sit under these runanga or um, tribal council structures and then they sit within these asset sort of holding companies. Those asset holding companies then, um, you know, implement these farming operations. But what's interesting about that is that at the tribal level, the tribes uh, have got this kind of world view that I was outlining. Then they attempt to implement through their tribal corporations. So these tribal corporations are running some of the most technologically sophisticated uh, farming operations in the country, but they're being shaped and directed by indigenous thinking and values and the way they operate. And there's a bit of a tension, uh, a real tension that, that occurs between um, the tribal corporations and the tribal owners um, and the tribal corporations are trying to deliver dividends to the tribes to invest in uh, cultural activities, um, uh, social welfare, all these types of initiatives, 
and at the same time as attempting to be environmentally um, sound and socially sound. And that sort of strong emphasis has sort of pushed those corporations into behaving in new and innovative ways, the types of technologies they uptake and, and apply. And I suppose that's to me is very interesting, is the way in which an indigenous knowledge system is taking control of uh, technology um, and systems and ideas and applying it through their own frame and doing very well out of it. And some of our research has shown that, uh, you know, some of the, the highest performing farming operations in New Zealand um, and those winning the most environmental awards are Maori operations using these types of um, thinking and systems. That's uh, where I think there's quite a lot of opportunity and uh, quite a lot of excitement. At the same time, it's a kind of a um, continuum within New Zealand of different Maori organisations from those that are often uh, with Maori, small Maori family land trusts and other organisations which are quite poor um, and struggling um, through to these large um, uh, corporate entities that are um, often thriving in the new environment. I, uh, I know some of our listeners' heads are getting dizzy right now, as is my own, um, but I, this is exactly why I'm talking to the two of you today, because I think there's a really fascinating story taking place in Aotearoa, New Zealand, notwithstanding a, a very troubled history. This, uh, you know, everything that you just described, John, the, the, the bringing together of uh, traditional values around whakapapa and modi, um, traditional governance structures, new governance structures, uh, technology and innovation. Um, and as you said, the, the, the proof is in the pudding in, in some of the, uh, the, the, the Maori-led enterprises um, uh, becoming real leaders in uh, both economic returns and sustainability, uh, the other dimensions of sustainability. Um, I, I really I want to come back to this, but I feel like I told our listeners at the beginning that we'd talk a little bit about dairy farming, and I feel like I want to bring that story in because it's it's a bit of a case study that reveals uh, maybe in a way how things can go wrong and provides also some uh, some glimpses into how things maybe can go right. Um, so in our opening, I, I mentioned that we'd talk about uh, livestock farming and climate change um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, the, the Livestock industry, you know, is about 49% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a big part of and a growing part, at least over the last 30 years, has been the dairy sector, which is up to about a quarter of total greenhouse gas emissions for Aotearoa, New Zealand, which compared to North America, dairying is maybe 2%. Um, but that's in part because it's such a huge export industry in, uh, in New Zealand with uh, markets in uh, China with for uh, powdered milk and in uh, the Middle East for uh, butter spreads and so on. Um, Hugh, can you tell us a bit about how this industry catapulted to where it is today? And I know I know I'm asking you to do a lot in a short time, but uh, maybe also a little bit about the environmental and social conflict that uh, came with it. Yes. Well, dairying was part of the great pastoral empire of New Zealand through its colonial phase, and but it was always second fiddle to sheep farming. When the great crisis came after 1973 and New Zealand lost its access to exclusive access to Britain, all these old traditional huge pastoral sectors went into a period of intense crisis. The dairy industry actually did reasonably well out of the crisis and has been on a, well, uh, as economists would see it, on a massive growth trajectory, mainly because the sheep industry really crashed badly, particularly wool markets around the world. And what's happened uh, is that we now have really two dairy industries in New Zealand existing side by side. There's the very old traditional dairy farming regions uh, like Taranaki, uh, where you have uh, multi-generational dairy farmers on reasonably small dairy units um, uh, with low levels of debt. And then you have the second wave of dairying, this kind of dairy frontier that pushed out over the last 20 years into the collapsing sheep and beef sector, which had tended to happen on more dry land. In that frontier, uh, the dairy industry uh, forged a new model for dairying in New Zealand, uh, which was uh, based under centre pivot irrigators uh, using um, a particular 
a variety of ryegrass and uh, and heavy application of nitrate fertilizers. And using that combination, dairy kind of colonized a whole new frontier of farming, which had once been dryland sheep farming, became wet dairying land. Uh, this is particularly along the east coast of the South Island, uh, where John is based uh, in Canterbury, uh, through parts just north of where I am in North Otago and Southland. And all the growth in the dairy sector really came from that, that new frontier of dairying. The catch being is that the frontier dairying is incredibly intensive. Uh, well, this is by New Zealand standards. Uh, it's still a grass-based system, so it's not really intensive in a North American sense. But by New Zealand standards, it was a level of intensity of production that had never been seen before. And uh, what happened was that that intensity began to cause two immediately problematic environmental effects. One is that you're just sticking a whole lot of big ruminants uh, uh, in the form of cows onto land that once had sheep. And, and they are generating a lot more greenhouse gases through, uh, what do we call them, politely, enteric emissions. Uh, so in terms of greenhouse gas profile, you've got a combination of a lot more cows on the landscape and a lot more nitrate fertilizers being used, which of course are also producing uh, a greenhouse gas. So that was the first immediate effect. But the second one, uh, which in some ways is even more compelling as a social uh, and political drama in New Zealand, is that this was happening in areas that they were dry, often quite sensitive fresh water systems. And the arrival of a, of a, of a heavier industrial model of farming into those systems has caused freshwater impacts and released a lot of nitrogen uh, into groundwater systems um, and has uh, unleashed a slow unfolding cascade of freshwater effects, which has become extraordinarily politically and socially contentious in New Zealand. To just round out the narrative, this really, the moment in which, in my uh, understanding as an academic, uh, the moment in which Pakeha New Zealand moved from basically saying, farming's great, farming's an enormously important part of our history, all our cousins are successful farmers, if there are a few minor environmental impacts, that's okay, to we have a major problem with farming in terms of its environmental impacts, happens around the year 2000. Uh, this is when this new frontier style of intensive dairying is starting to really gain pace. And a public campaign called the Dirty Dairying Campaign after 2001 emerged. And it was really the first time that there had been political and social backlash against farming. And since the Dirty Dairying Campaign, which was a straight out set of uh, media advertisements and protests against dairying, dairy impacts on freshwater systems, since then, uh, it's really been all on. And questions about the environmental impact of dairying, both in terms of its freshwater impacts and at a broader level, its climate change impacts have been a very, very hot political issue and social issue ever since. I knew you could do it, Hugh. You uh, you packed a lot in there, and, and that's a, a, a really compact summary of uh, at least over 100 years of, of change and then certainly uh, you know the, the, the big changes that have happened since the early 90s and, and then 2000s with this increased attention and concern from Pakeha New Zealanders and 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 I, I guess I want to bring the, t the 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 timeline back because John was talking about the uh, some of the treaty settlement processes um, really coming to uh, fruition in the 1990s and some of this land coming back to uh, coming into iwi control uh, under corporations and various various governance structures in the 1990s some of which is in dairy some of which is in uh, commercial forestry so john can I, i'd like to go back to you because um, you're now working with iwi who uh, manage lands where people are looking perhaps uh, you know maori may have looked in this way for a long time and new zealanders in general are looking very carefully at how uh, land is used and what the environmental impacts are both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and on water how how do you see that from the kind of work that you do yeah sure so just uh, i might take one step back um and just outline that um so we've had the settlement processes, uh, which iwi have had um, land returned, um, and which um, a number of iwi are engaged in, in uh, 
you know, dairy farming today, but there's also been a, a reasonably long history of Māori dairy farming um, in various parts of the country and the formation of corporate cooperatives, you know, and being quite successful at different times in, in New Zealand's history, but then not finding the institutional support structures needed to support Māori. So this, for example, not being able to access financing or other things to develop um, their dairy farming initiatives. But then to come forward into this sort of 90s period, um, when Māori were having land returned and then were starting to engage in dairy farming um, on scale. And uh, I think certainly being in the room <clears throat> when some of those decisions were being made, um, there were a lot of questions and concerns around the impact of what the impact of dairy would have on um, fresh water. And particularly from certainly a Naitahu perspective, which um, was most familiar, um, the impact on mahi no kai, which is the traditional food resources um, that are gathered out of um, freshwater systems. And uh, so there was a lot of concern about the expansion of dairying and particularly the tribe going into dairying. But at the same time, there's this sort of pressure. Um, you've got land returned and um, you need to be able to make um, some return on that land for your own people. And so um, it's also being put into this unenviable position of needing to make a return off your land at the same time as everybody else is going through this sort of dairy gold rush sort of tsunami that was happening, certainly in the Canterbury region where I am, where every, everybody was, um, well, all the farmers and were converting in the dry land areas to dairy from, um, from sheep. And so there was like this need to be on board to be able to get this, you know, take advantage of this economic benefit. But at the same time, um, this sort of concern about what the impact would be. So um, in response, there's, there was this thing, well, if we're going to go in this direction, we need to do it in a way that is as responsible as possible. And to be able to um, put in place the restrictions and the the demands on what our farms, how and how they need to perform and what they need to do. So that was kind of, you know, sort of what was happening there. But it also differs around the country. Some parts of the country um, can, in terms of land type, is, is, is much better at um, accommodating dairy farming, um, whereas um, some areas are far less accommodating and just in terms of their um, the environmental footprint it leaves. So you also find large differences between iwi and, um, you know, their level of comfort of entering into dairying and its impact. But the other thing happening at the same time was the um, Māori were, really, were, were gaining um, greater governing rights into their regional and local areas, um, particularly around setting policy and regulation around um, water and what, what land uses could occur in particular areas. You also see this influence coming through at a governance level with Māori starting to influence um, what can happen. But that certainly the early 2000s period, Māori had very limited influence into uh, what was happening more broadly and what could happen on land in terms of regulation. Uh, when I was in Aotearoa, New Zealand last year, uh, looking at the dairy industry and climate change, this is a, a project I became very interested in as I had conversations with many people across the country about uh, dairying and and what it mean uh, a, a few things struck me um first you know as we've discussed this industry is massive uh, it's differentiated in the way that you uh, indicated and john i'm glad you brought the uh, the earlier maori history of dairying as well forward um, but it is certainly a massive industry today uh, with uh, so contributing a good part to the country's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it also appeared to me that uh, just after probably two decades of the industry, along with um, agricultural sector in general, maybe resisting the climate change question and not really wanting to deal with it um, through various, uh, both um, research and government pushing and uh, you know, there's there's various points of impact where uh, the industry has been developing a real sense that they have to do something on this issue. And I think the dirty dairying campaign that Hugh was alluding to is all part of the, the loss of social license that the sector uh, has maybe 
has had in New Zealand in the last couple of decades that have been forcing uh, the industry to look more carefully at itself and its actions. Um, the third thing that I found very interesting is that, um, you know, the, the solutions, at least in terms of achieving net zero emissions by 2050, are are not there yet. There's been some really interesting research by Andy Reisinger from the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Center, working with industry players that suggests that uh, mitigating sources of greenhouse gas emissions is technically possible, you know, through... Uh, um, methane inhibitors in feed uh, by breeding lower um, GHG producing uh, livestock. Um, but those, you know, th there's a lot of things that have to go right for the same herd size to be there by 2050 and uh, producing uh, much less methane, uh, much less uh, nitrous oxides, and thus uh, being part of this net zero solution. Um, so, in some, the industry can potentially get there if a lot of things go right, um, but there also have to be other other options, other directions for the future of of this industry and for land uses in Aotearoa. And I I I just wonder if if that that's my sense of where things are at. But I'd I'd welcome uh, both of your thoughts on on where is the industry now and where do you see it going, um, and maybe. Uh, Turning first to uh, to Hugh, like, w w do you do you think that there's going to be a sustainable dairying system in New Zealand? What do you think that's going to look like? Yes, it was. I mean, it was very interesting. I mean, the discussions we had last year when you were visiting were extremely interesting on this, and it's always good to get an outside voice, especially someone who's from a similar uh, sort of settler agricultural um, uh, milieu in in Canada. And I have sort of pondered. Um, since we first began having these discussions, um, what are the what are the trajectories forward from here? And I think I'd, I characterised it a few minutes ago as saying, you know, that there are two worlds of dairying in New Zealand. There's old dairying in the established dairy regions like Taranaki, and then there's the new frontier stuff in Canterbury. And I think the answer is quite different for both. I think there will be pathways into more sustainable, more climate-friendly dairying in the old systems uh, for two reasons. One is that on multi-generational dairy farms, I think that um, there's just a lot deeper culture, um, a, a lot more sort of acquaintanceship and relationality with your land. But also in places like Taranaki, um, there's a very, there's, they've already made the first moves towards working with regional government and working with iwi in terms of what is appropriate use of land and how can that land start to live to its full potential uh, within a dairy farm uh, rather than its full productive potential. But the other world of dairying is where the real crisis is going to be, the, the frontier dairying, because they, didn't, they are caught between two massive crises. Uh, the first being this eroding sense of uh, public, social and political trust, you know, what the, what the consultants call the social license to farm, being created by initially this freshwater crisis, uh, but more generally it will become part of our, our climate ad adaptation uh, strategies over the next 10 years. So that's one crisis. But the other crisis is that they borrowed a huge amount of money to put on those big centre pivots and uh, buy Holstein Frisian dairy cows and pour lots of nitrate onto highly specialised ryegrass. And the frontier dairy farms are massively indebted. And they are pushing right out to the edge of, the, of their systems just to try and keep the banks at bay. And at the moment, it's all working out OK because there's a reasonable amount of demand out, out of China because of, of COVID and, uh, and interest rates are historically low. But we're about two base points in mortgage rates away from a massive meltdown out in frontier dairying, at which point you're not talking about whether that dairy system is going to ad adapt to climate change. You're talking about a whole lot of that land returning to other forms of farming that will be more climate friendly. So that's that's my take on it. Um, I think John and I were on a farm trip. Uh, um, we, we were on a farm visit a couple of years ago out in the centre of that dairy frontier in mid canterbury and uh, the farmer who invited us onto his farm that day you know from their perspective he he pointed around himself at his highly intensive dairy farm that he was trying to modify and said 20 years come back this will not be here he said we are 
We are trying absolutely everything that science can provide for us, every technology to mitigate our impact, to reduce our freshwater impacts. We're trying everything. As far as I can currently see, we're going to get about halfway to where we need to be. So he said, we need some kind of miracle in the next 20 years to mean that dairying will still be in these parts of New Zealand or else something else will be happening here. John, what is your uh, sense? Because, you know, you described organizations like Naitahu Farming also have some of those big uh, central pivot irrigators on some of their dairying properties. How how do you see uh, Maori land use maybe either following one of the trajectories that you just pointed out, or maybe it's going down a different path because of its different history and governance structure and values? Yeah, sure. So, um I believe that, um, well, depending on the type of land they're farming, that um, Maori will diversify out of out of dairy in those dry um, dryland uh, frontier areas. Although those farms are winning environmental awards for their performance, their ability to um, to get their nitrate levels to a point on those particular types of environmental conditions and soils and to get to that level in terms of reducing their carbon footprint. Um, yeah, then just like you're saying, I think um, they will likely shift to a different uh, land use over the next um, uh, few years um, to be able to comply. And uh, just also to add to what Hugh was saying is that um, certainly in the development of the Canterbury region, there was a significant sort of well, strong collaboration between banks and uh, uh, our central government in terms of Crown Irrigation to put in place the infrastructure for the expansion of dairy from sort of 2000 and onward, onwards. And that has been a massive um, investment, not just of um, you know, farmers, but um, banks, but also in terms of public investment in terms of the, the large range of the water, water infrastructure. And like you said, paying that off is, is going to be a major issue. John, earlier in this uh, podcast, Hugh, uh, talked about Maori leadership within the agricultural sector and that this, uh, you know, has has been growing and was perhaps not something he would have expected to see in the same way 25 years ago. And uh, as, as an example, and I, I'm, I'm just curious your take on this, I sent uh, in advance and I can put it up on the website, uh, there's a document called uh, Hewaka Ekanoa, which is the primary sector's response to the challenge to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, that came out in 2019 across uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, signed on by a whole bunch of mainstream farming organizations. Um, and seemingly, you know, it has a Maori name and, and it uh, refers directly to Maori values. And is, is this symbolic? Is this a, a form of greenwashing? Or do you, you know, is this part of a, a, a political shift that you think is taking place, uh, beginning to take place in New Zealand? I think, it. you know, um, when I read that document, I was, you know, reasonably impressed by the way they had brought in Maori ways of thinking and concepts and approaches to frame um, their strategy. And I do know that there was um, a reasonable amount of Maori input into its development. And also, um, there was also some pushback from, from certain quarters amongst Maori as to whether um, it was uh, genuine or whether it was genuinely representing uh, Maori thinking and ideas. You know, I think certainly within industry leadership, it's recognised and seen um, by in, in many quarters. But whether that cascades down through and across um, New Zealand's farming co culture overall, which is you know generally conservative, um, that would be that'll be another question. But um, I suppose I'm always hopeful and optimistic, and um, I think um, you know generally things are heading in the right direction. If I would just join in there with what John's saying, I think um, one of the things that's struck me uh, in recent years, and, and partly it's because of uh, you know the work that John and his his research group have done um, in terms of just 
quietly elaborating and allowing all these new land use patterns uh, to be thought about and to think about ways to bring Maori principles into the way in which we farm, is that really what a striking difference that is to what I experienced in my own childhood. So in the 1960s, um, in those last 10 years of the great boom time of New Zealand colonial pastoral agriculture, uh, when you looked at government documents uh, and reports and public media and active, you know, the judgments happening in courts, Maori, Maori land, the land that was still in Maori uh, ownership, um, was derided as unproductive. It was described as wasteland. There were open political calls for the final remnant of the Maori farming estate to be handed over to Pākehā so it could be modernised and rendered scientific and productive. And so really, you know, you, you, if you go back to the 1960s, uh, Māori land was an object of derision. It was object to really undisguised racist policy and orientations in terms of our university agricultural scientists and the like. So to, to fast forward to now, uh, really messes with my historical understanding of where I came from because uh, you know what John and his group and many others have done is really placed Maori at the forefront of our response strategies uh, and he hasn't had time today to talk about you know some of the work that's been done around linking Maori land use to other forms of alternative agriculture like organic or regenerative and those kind of dialogues that are emerging but looking at it in a long historical sense what we're experiencing now is just profoundly different to where New Zealand was as a pastoral colonial agricultural country. Thank you, Hugh and John. This has been a fascinating conversation, and um, I feel like you've left us both with a, a lot to think about and, and sort of make sense of, but also uh, a sense of, of hope and of change. Um, you know, whether Everything will be done in the next 29 years that is anticipated. Uh, we'll only know when we get there, but uh, it is amazing to see how, how things can change in the way that uh, you both have been describing. So I want to thank you both for joining us on the EcoPolitics podcast. As a reminder, this podcast is made, made available under a Creative Commons license 2.0. Please share it and use it widely. We just ask that you provide attribution. You can follow us on Twitter at EcopoliticsP and uh, get in touch via our website, site, ecopoliticspodcast.ca. The Global Ecopolitics Podcast is produced by Nicole Bedford. Support with transcription and captioning is provided by Kika Mueller, and Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. Thank you so much to our guests today, and we'll see you all at the next episode. Stay tuned.